Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship on this Sunday, June 14th. I so wish that you could be here with me right now and we could be having a church picnic on the church grounds. Every year on this Sunday in June, we celebrate the end of another year together, of learning together through Sunday school, of singing together with the choir, and this is a Sunday of celebration outside, of of using the, the parachute, of eating together, of having a celebration together. On this Sunday, as we think about former times, I have a question for you. Have you ever changed your mind? Have you ever decided that something that you didn't like before is now something that you do like? Or was there something that you thought before that you then realized that you were wrong and that you needed to rethink what you believed? The Sunday is a time of thinking about the disciples. So once again, we hear about Jesus calling the 12 disciples and each of the disciples changed their minds and changed their lives to follow Christ. They realized that the ways that they had been living was not in line with what God wanted them to be. And so they changed their jobs, they changed their livelihoods, they changed how they lived each day. And as Christians, as followers of Christ ourselves, we are capable of change too. Another way of talking about God's grace is talking about the ways that God helps us to change. When we were wrong, when we are mistaken, when we thought something was true and then learned that it wasn't, God holds us fast and encourages us and helps us to grow. There's been a lot happening in our world and in our country these days. If you've heard bits and pieces, there's been a lot in the news about people being upset, being sad, and asking for change. This is a time, especially for us who are white, the color of our skin is white, this is a time for many of us to learn about the ways that our brothers and sisters in Christ experience the world slightly differently. And it's a time of learning and growing and committing to changing our minds that when what we thought was true is not actually true, is not a shared experience by our brothers and sisters, this is a time of remembering that because of God's grace, we are capable of change. We are capable of changing our minds, of changing our lives, of changing our worlds. As Christ invites his disciples, He invites them to come and to care for their neighbors. Christ is inviting us just the same today to care and love, to listen to our neighbors and to understand if they are hurting, if they are sad, what has caused them to be that way. And we are called to be a part of the process of change because the good news of Christ is that because of God's grace, we can change. Thanks be to God. And I so look forward to next year gathering with you in this space. And here's to next year's picnic already. I hope you can have a picnic today or celebrate outside and with your family in some fun way. And remember, as we are called to learn and grow, God's love holds us fast each and every day. Amen. Amen. Good morning again. What a joy it is to be gathering remotely for home worship. Again, as much as I wish that we could gather safely here and celebrate our end of year church picnic, I trust that even as we gather at a distance, the Holy Spirit connects us near and far. And we give thanks for that this day. Our two scripture readings for today are about God surprising us. In the gospel reading, we hear about Jesus's calling of the 12 disciples. Do you remember the song from last fall when we learned it together? There were 12 disciples Jesus called to help him. It goes, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, his brother, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas, and Bartholomew. Once again, it's not a pop quiz. But scripture reminds us of the 12 original followers of Christ who gave up their livelihoods, who who changed their ways, their daily practices to be a part of Christ's healing ministry. The second verse of the song reminds us that Jesus calls us to 
Jesus calls us to, we are his disciples, I am one and you. The good news of God's grace is that we can change. We can change our lives, we can change our minds, we can change the ways that we have been stuck and the ways that we have been set to be realigned with God's will for the world. Just as the early disciples hear Christ's call to teach, to preach, to heal, to tend for their neighbors, so Christ calls us too. Our second scripture reading for today involves Abraham and Sarah. The story of Abram and Sarai who become Abraham and Sarah is a story of God's covenantal love. How through these two imperfect people, God nevertheless moved, moved to bring God's word in and to the world. Through their stories, there are many complicated moments, moments of heartbreak, moments of ethical crossings. There are moments of wondering where God is in the midst of some of the darkness, especially in the midst of Abraham and Sarah's intertwining of their story with Hagar their story gets complicated. The story involves heartbreak and hurt. But our passage today is around Sarah's infertility. In her old age, she is still not born a child for Abraham, and she is wondering where God is in the midst of it. And in this story, Sarah hears the good news that even in the midst of their old age, they will have a child, and she laughs. It's hard to tell from the scripture whether it was a scoffing laugh, whether she wrote off God's grace and said, no way that could happen. Or maybe it was a laugh of pure joy. Maybe it was a laugh of receiving of this good news, of recognizing the ways that God's grace could change not just her mind, but also her body, could change her very experience of the world. In the midst of the story of Abraham and Sarah, we experience the complexities of God's grace, the ways that it surprises us, the ways that it astounds us, the ways that it moves us in ways that we might not have chosen for ourselves, but nevertheless is good. This Sunday, as we continue our Presby What series, this Sunday we're focusing on God with us. Again, the reformer John Calvin writes that we cannot separate our knowledge of God with our knowledge of ourselves. They are both intertwined. And part of that knowledge is the recognition that we cannot fully know who we are, who we are called to be, without knowing the grace of God. That even when we fall short, Christ calls us, Christ binds us, Christ lifts us up anyway and moves us in ways that we couldn't have anticipated. In these days, as we talk about, as we think about God's grace, it's important to name the sin that we know in this world. Within the Presbyterian tradition, we use the language of original sin. This idea is that even before we have taken our first steps, even before we have said our first words, we have been born into a world that is sinful, born into a world that is hurting, and born into a world that we are already complicit before we have even begun to fully participate in it. A good example of original sin is around the understanding of racism and white supremacy. Jim Wallace, the 21st century theologian, names in his recent work that America's original sin is racism and and white privilege. Jim Wallace names that for us white people, we can inhabit a world, and again, even without actively participating in white supremacy, we can nevertheless benefit from the systems that surround us. So even when we have not actively participated, even when we personally condone racism, we are still participating in the systems that exist in our world today. So to better understand racism, I wanted to take a step back. When I was living in St. Louis, I had the privilege and the honor of getting to to show up and witness, getting to show up and listen to the testimonials of my black sisters and brothers in St. Louis who are experiencing racism in a wide range of ways. Everything from police brutality to unequal school systems. It was very enlightening to hear how my experience of the U.S. was very different from my siblings of color. It was a time of humility. It was a time of vulnerability, and it was a time of confession. 
as Presbyterians, we practice confession every week. And these are especially the moments, the starting points of confessing individually and together, the ways that we have participated in systems of original sin. So let me say more. Part of our confession, let me model for you now. Our confession as to this original sin of American racism begins with the words of saying, I am racist. So as we break down this understanding of racism, racism is privilege plus power. Excuse me, prejudice plus privilege. Prejudice meaning meaning that I can hold a set of views around skin color And the power that the power systems that exist allow me to occupy the world in a certain way and to not have my understanding questioned. So, for example, a good question to ask is when was the first time you had a teacher whose color of their skin was different than yours? As I think about my own suburban upbringing, almost all of my teachers were white. The first teacher of color I had wasn't until I got to college. And that's just one surface level example. But as you think about the voices in your lives, the educators, as you thought about the voices that you have heard, the systems that we live in are set up to amplify certain voices while decreasing the voices of others. So as we confess, I am a racist, this is the first step towards the practice of anti-racism. This is the current terminology that we must not be colorblind. We must not pretend that racism is not an issue. Rather, we must commit to the work of anti-racism. Theologian James Cone wrote a book kind of further, further illuminating America's original sin. James Cone is a, was a black theologian who taught for many years at Union Seminary in New York. James's work was entitled, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. He he talked about the practice of lynching throughout the American South, as well as in the North, including here in Delaware, and how lynching, this extra legal punishment, was nevertheless sanctioned by the state in a way that Christ's own crucifixion was also a lynching. And through this work, he spoke about how, for the black church, the Christian gospel is God's message of liberation in an unredeemed and tortured world. The crucifixion of Christ is central to the black church's understanding of who Christ is and who Christ calls us to be. For us white Christians, there are probably times when we look at the cross we get uncomfortable, uncomfortable with its violence, uncomfortable with what it depicts, the human suffering that we see. And yet the cross reminds us that God makes a way out of no way, as Cone writes, that in the midst of the truth of this world, the truths of our neighbors, that they are suffering, that they are experiencing active, active repression, active oppression in the name of the state. Cone reminds us that Christ's gospel is one of liberation. Cone reminds us that to be a follower of Christ is to commit to to an experience of transformation. And this is where grace comes in. For as we name, as we confess that we are racist, we begin to take the step towards God's kingdom, towards God's work in this world, towards a beloved community. one in which we can begin to right the wrongs that have existed in this world, one in which we can begin to learn how to live together in a different way. One of the recent movements that has begun to take root in the U.S. is called the Poor People's Campaign. On June 20th, this campaign is viral. There was to be a mass rally in person in Washington, but with the current pandemic, it has moved online. This movement is intersectional. This movement recognizes that to be an anti-racist means that you also have to be pro-environment, means that you also have to be pro-health care, means that you have to be pro-education. For all of the ways that these systems of white privilege are set up to benefit white people at the expense of black Americans, at the expense of indigenous Americans, these systems have to begin to be unpacked and then reconstructed in a way that we can all benefit, that we can all live a full life. 
Because what we are hearing is that our siblings, our siblings of color cannot breathe. And the question for us is, are we listening? In these days, how do we begin to listen? I invite us to reflect this day as we think about God with us, God calling us individually and collectively to be in this world in a different way, to change our hearts, to change our minds, to change our actions, our practices, to change the very systems of our society. Christ invites us to listen. So I invite you to listen in this way today. I invite you to think first, what is something that you have read or a person that you have heard recently who's helped you learn about racism, who's helped you to learn about white privilege, who's helped you to think in a different way this day? When you think about that article or that interview, when you think about that book or even that piece of work, whether it's the film Just Mercy, whether it's something that you've seen on YouTube, write it down and then send it to me. And when you send it to me in an email or by mail, or even give me a call or send me a text, I want you to include the answer to this question. What is something or what are you needing to learn about as we begin to unpack racism together? As we as a church near and far begin to think about the ways that we have benefited from white supremacy, what is something that you are wanting to learn more about? A piece of our history, of Delaware's history, of American history, a piece of, of governmental practice, or even just the pieces around how, we've, how we are even taught history. Think about something that you are wanting to learn more about and note that down too. And then this is the third piece. As we think about grace, as we think about God changing our minds and changing our worlds, how is God inviting you to change? Is there some way that you are being called individually or you are, are feeling called collectively to change our actions, to change something? Note that down as well. So of these three things, I invite you to share with me something that you've read or heard or encountered recently that's helped you to reframe what you thought was true, something that you are needing to learn more about in terms of racism, white supremacy, or just how we came to be where we are today as a nation. And the third piece is that as we think about grace, how do you feel God moving and stirring you in your life? And how is that individually or collectively something that we as a church could be committing to together? Again, welcome, welcome to the work of theological exploration of God's grace as we think about God with us, Emmanuel. Know that you are not alone, that the God of Abraham and Sarah, who carried them through their old age, through the impossibility of parenthood, carried them through until the birth of Isaac, of he who laughs, Sarah's laughter bringing forth, peeling forth, reminding us of God's goodness and God's surprising grace. So may you be surprised this day. May you be surrounded by God's grace as we change our minds and as we change our world. Amen. Amen.